Welcome to Color is Not Black and White, Color Management Part 2. I'm Scott Silsby and I'll be presenting the second session. In the second session, the, objective, the objectives remain identical to the first session. We're going to continue to identify critical components of the digital workflow and color management. We're also going to look at what it takes to connect these variables to the device capabilities. Again, if we define these things, we reduce risk, and we have a higher rate of success. In part one, we defined the playing field. We looked at the variables. We also looked at how to get the solution right the first time. The way we do that is we define these variables. We look at what device, define the device. We understand that device has limitations and capabilities. We look at what paper we're going to use, substrate, and we realize that some substrates have a higher color capability than others. We also look at the inks we use, and those inks, some of them have capabilities that others do not. For instance, dye ink and pigment ink might have different water fast or light fast capabilities. So in the next section here, we're going to look at how to stay in the game. And we're going to look at how to manage the disappointment. After we define the playing field of these variables, printer, paper, ink, workflow, target, and tolerance, and after we looked at these variables and defined them, and we put together a workflow and created some kind of a solution, and realize that in the digital printing industry there really aren't any targets that we can target towards, and we don't know there aren't really any tolerances that are defined, that has to be discussed between you and the customer, and it has to be identified, and it has to be organized and delivered in a way that's understood, or these ex expectations will not be met. To get the solution right the first time, we have to understand all these variables, not just what printer we're going to use, not just what ink we're going to use, or what paper we're going to use, but how we handle the files, how we mark this color onto the paper, how we transform that idea and try to match a target. That target can be subjective or objective. It can be construed in the mind or assigned to a value with a measurement device. The purpose, whether it's color, content, or both, has to be defined. And we have to manage these expectations. Again, in the Color Management Conference for the PIA in 2011 in Phoenix, we attended sessions, and they talked about managing these realistic color expectations. And again, this is an industry-wide conference. Theoretical transformations of color, whether it's early binding, defining a specific spot color early on, or using some kind of a color management with an ICC profile, all has to be discussed. All has to be hammered out and defined early in the process. If it's not, we're only going by a best guess scenario. The accuracy will be dependent upon how much information we get early on in the customer engagement. Standard viewing conditions. This is a review of the first session. There's only one legal way to view color, and that's the 5,000 degrees Kelvin at 45 degree angle in North America. This is at least one constant we can rely on in all of these variables. And as we define these processes, whether it's subjective or objective, and whether or not we have and accept risks, then we can define whether or not we are acceptable and within tolerance and hitting that target. If we do not define target, we do not define tolerance, we have high risk and more failure possibilities. Plus, we're going to destroy our credibility, or at least reduce it. So you can liken that into a penalty flag being thrown into this game. But we want to stay in this game, don't we? So let's call a timeout. Let's not just stop and say we failed. Let's find out what we have to do to recover after we failed. First of all, 
let's take a step back. Do we really understand these variables? Do we really understand that the paper does contribute to the amount of color available on the device? Do we realize that te technology combined with the paper and the ink you use defines how much color is available or the gamut available on the device? You cannot put more color on a paper that cannot hold that much ink. It's physically impossible. So what influences quality? Is it just the device, the engine? Is it the color workflow? Is it the ink? What is it that affects quality in these solutions? What is dependent? Well, the device itself, of course, delivers and marks on the paper. But the paper, especially in the inkjet industry, is the largest influence on how much color we have in the solution. Paper drives gamut size. Paper is our first variable. We can consider that as one of the five colorants we use, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, plus the paper. Because the paper influences the color that much. The whiteness of the paper, the optical brighteners that might be added to the paper, the ability for that paper to hold the ink at the surface, or allow it to absorb in, or to keep it from spreading, all of that are components that drive how much color we can get out of the paper. So the paper is huge when it comes to this discussion. Print differences can be noticed if you use the same data and just change the paper. There can be a wide variety of color output. Or we can use the same data and use different color conversion parameters, and we can have a wide variety of output. Or we can limit how much ink goes on the same paper, and we can have a wide variety of output. The point is, color management takes on many nuances. It's not just submitting a file to a printer and pressing go. So the combination of ink, whether it's dye or pigment, the media, or the paper, and its ink receiving layer, combined with the engine, the head it uses, the screening sets, and the settings within the engine, all combine to reach a certain quality. Notice the image bottom left. The red and black dots tend to soak in and spread. They're not real defined. Image bottom right, the red and the black dots tend to hold their shape better. The one on the right, you can see with the example behind, has a much more colorful look. You could say the, the colors are more saturated, it's more colorful. It may be that the image on the right might have barcodes or text in the document. And because those dots are held, or you have good dot fixation, it would be easier to read by eye or even with a barcode reader. Or if you're using mica ink, it can hold that dot, keep it from spreading. So in that particular instance, paper or media becomes very, very important as to what you want to try to reach. Now, of course, the higher color available, usually the higher cost of the media. In inkjet printing, offset printing, and toner printing, let's look at some examples of a cross-section of paper. Upper left, we see inkjet uncoated on uncoated paper. Notice how the ink soaks into the paper, goes in quite a way into the paper, and it tends to dilute. And when you look at the numeral 4 and the letter P, you can see that that magenta-looking ink there isn't very strong. It's not very saturated. It's because the ink is soaked into the paper. If you look at the dry toner, notice it stands on the surface of the paper because toner is a large particle. It doesn't soak into the fibers or the fillers. It stands more on the surface. So therefore, it gives you a visual representation of a more saturated uh, color on uncoated paper. In the offset industry, depending, of course, on the type of ink you use, but most of the offset industry uses an oil-based type ink, you'll get a representation of what you see on screen. Yes, some of it will stay near the surface, but some of it will soak in. You don't get quite as saturated a color and vibrant as a color as you do if you use coated paper. So let's look at the lower section of examples. Coated inkjet paper, dry toner, and offset. And when I say inkjet paper, 
I say that because the coatings on inkjet paper most likely will not be like the coatings on offset or toner optimized paper. Coated means different things in different industries. In the inkjet industry, media that's coated means that it's optimized for inkjet use. If you want to try to represent something like a glossy look, you'd call it gloss coated and inkjet optimized. And there are many terms that come into play when describing optimized inkjet paper. In the center section, you see toner again on this coated paper. In this particular case, this would be a glossy coating, not an inkjet optimized coating. Notice the toner stays even more on top of the paper, and you get a little bit more color out of it. Not a lot, but a little bit more. So therefore, you can see in toner technologies, that toner is going to stand on top of the substrate, giving us a more colorful, balanced look across most substrates. There's less variance. Easier to manage that, actually. So in the offset industry, you can see on a coated sheet that the ink is being held on the surface. Again, giving a more colorful, more saturated, more detailed look to the numeral 4 and the letter P. So you can see how we attack these issues of how we allow the ink to either absorb, spread, or be held out by using special coatings on inkjet paper. Whether it's coated or treated depends upon the manufacturer, and what they use to coat or treat it depends upon the manufacturer, and whether or not using dye or pigment ink. Again, if we're looking at uncoated paper with water-based inkjet pigment or water-based inkjet dye, there's very little visual difference between the two with inkjet because they're both playing into the surface of the paper. If we use a coated or inkjet treated or coated paper, notice how the ink, the letter A, is more vibrant, more colorful, more saturated. So whether you're using pigment or dye, the color gamut isn't going to change a lot. But the coatings for inkjet and dye may be slightly different, the treatments for the inkjet. So these are some variables we need to consider when we're looking at solutions for customers. So let's recover from this failure. Let's draw a huddle. Let's look at the original expectations. First of all, did we define what we needed? If we did, then we should be able to define the failure point. Was the failure point the gamut? Can we address that with a different paper or substrate? Or with a different ink? dye or pigment? Was the failure point the rub resistance or the light fastness or water fastness of it? If it was, we can address that with a different type of ink. If the complaint was general and nonspecific, then we can't address it. If it was a variable data issue where the content was incorrect, then we can address that with software or solutions. So as you can see, without defining the failure points accurately, and without defining the workflow up front, there's no way we're going to hit solutions correctly. So how do we manage the disappointment? Obviously, there's going to be times where a customer or a customer's customer may be disappointed with the output. Let's look at the expectations. Let's define what they are. More importantly, let's look at what the industry says about this. Managing expectations. Again, Color Management Conference 2011 in Phoenix for the Printing Industries of America. Here's our options, they say. We can control the relationship. Or we can let it control you. Or just close your eyes and walk away. So obviously, we want to try to control a relationship. That's kind of a silly slide, but it does happen in the industry. So let's not be afraid of our customers. What does that mean? Well, we need to set guidelines and get an agreement. Now, it doesn't mean we go in and dictate the direction they're going to go. That means we speak to them, look at what they want to try to go towards, and you and them or us and them define a process, procedure, and workflow that will target a specific tolerance. 
So it doesn't really matter if they define it, you define it, we define it. We all get together in a huddle and do it. As long as it's defined, as long as there's a goal, then we can move towards that goal and try to reach these expectations. Now, there's a lot of questions that need to be asked in these initial contacts with a customer. First of all, we have to understand what their expectation is. We can't just assume that we know what they want to do, but being human, we usually do assume things, don't we? But how do you get this information? Well, the only one way, you have to communicate with them, and whether you do it email, face-to-face, -face, notes, etc., it doesn't really matter. We have to communicate and work through the process. We have to find out what the customer's desires are. We have to communicate that to the people that are providing the solution in order to give a complete and accurate solution. Let's look at what clients might expect. Let's define clients into categories. First of all, let's look at novice clients. Now, what's a novice client? Well, if you're a transactional customer coming into the digital color world, that could be defined as a novice client. If you're an offset color expert printing on large sheet-fed Heidelberg, Camori, et cetera, presses, you might have decades of experience in the offset industry. But the digital industry is different. So they're still novices when they come into the digital color world, especially with inkjet. We've already seen that substrate is a huge influence on color in inkjet. It has some influence in the offset industry, and it has even less in the toner industry. But novice clients might expect a mediocre output, or they might expect perfection. And if they expect perfection, we know we don't print perfection. Nobody does. So the customers that are novices, they generally don't understand things like the gamut limitations, variations within print. These are target and tolerance discussions. The viewing effects of lighting, the influence of substrate on a print solution. Many times they just don't understand these things. We have to walk them down the path of understanding. Another category would be experienced clients. Well, they might understand all of these things like the limitations of gamut, the variances and tolerances from run to run or within a run or across the sheet. They might understand these. They might understand the influence of viewing conditions, and they want the best possible result. That's a best-case scenario. At least we don't have to educate them from a base level all the way to the end. We can at least have a beginning understanding conversation with them because they understand limitations. The reality is many clients don't even care about the printer's limitations. Some of their expectations are unrealistic. Many colors they want to try to hit are out of a printing color gamut, not available in CMYK. They don't really accept sometimes that devices and processes drift. There's a tolerance assigned. They don't really understand that consumer rules change. Paper, ink, the environment, these things can vary. And sometimes they don't understand that viewing conditions affect appearance, therefore affect acceptable or non-acceptable print. This is the reality we face in the world. So, Again, in this color management conference, setting expectations was the goal of this presentation. What do we hope to get out of setting expectations? Well, let's look at what the industry says about this. Basic questions. What is a color contract? Is there one real or implied between you and the customer, between the customer and their buyer? Was there a proof used? That's a target. Is it made to a recognized spec? Was it grackle swap, etc., or was it their own custom specification? By the way, there's different levels of grackle swap and fogger, etc. So, is the press or the printing process calibrated? Was the paper linearized? Is it within specification? Is there a repeatable process applied to it? Yes, from a sales standpoint, it's hard to control all of that, but these are things that have to be managed throughout the workflow.
What's a color contract? Well, without one, there's no reasonable expectation. Well, how do we handle a color contract? You know, without a color contract, neither party is protected. The client can't pr- prove that the printer failed or succeeded. We have little defense against the customer, the client's whim, or their client's whim, because nothing's been defined up front. What do we mean by a color contract? We have some definitions and standards that we try to match. Some of them, like data prep for full-color printing or full-color workflow guides, help the customer understand how they need to prepare files in order to have a workflow defined and a process defined that's repeatable and successful. So that's a standardization type document. We also work at looking at documents and realizing that really there's only two things that we print in documents, images or vector. Text is either bitmapped images or vector graphics. So we either print bitmap images or objects which are vector gra- graphics, like line segments, curves, color spaces, um, etc. cetera, um, spot color. So these vector graphics or bitmap images are really the only two things we print. And controlling how those convert throughout the process is the only way we can guarantee a targeted output. So understanding that we really are only printing one of two different things in a workflow, we can simplify the discussion and hopefully standardize the workflow. Now the reality is, of course, in a customer's workflow, we can't go in and change every bit of data flow but we can give recommendations. And sometimes they are in control of emitting these parameters. So if you can't have this discussion with them, then get somebody in the technical end of the organization involved with them so that we can begin to define these things so that we have a known output, we have a target, we have a tolerance, we can hit it. So how do we check these files? Well, there's several different ways you can do it. There are literally dozens of programs in the industry. The Adobe Creative Suite is the industry standard for doing image and object manipulation and creation. But again, there are many, many others out there for PCs or Macs in order to run specific programs to create files. All of these are tunable. All of these you can define the values of images and objects, the color settings all of the settings that go into determining whether or not the file is print ready. So we have these in-house. We have people with expertise in-house that can help the customers define their workflow and tune their workflow. We also have InFocus Pit Stop, which is a plug-in into our server, Prisma Production Server. It's an in-focus pit stop server uh, version running on top of our Prisma production server. And it can do some pre-flighting as well. This is another industry standard PDF editing program. We also have AFP editing inside of Prisma production where we can change colors, especially spot colors. We can verify structure and the content and uh, the object, et cetera, in the AFP pre-flighting. So we have utilities, not only that are third party, but are also inherent with our, our own OSE products that can help to define and perfect workflow. So to optimize quality, there are some things we need to consider. We need to make color easy and predictable. The way we do that is we apply a standardization, whether it's spot color matching and optimizing, or we're using a certified proof we need to develop a process and control that process. If we have a reference set we're trying to target, that is, we're trying to match a corporate identity, uh, a specific color, a proof, then we need to define how far out of tolerance we can be and still hit that target. Again, industry standard says five delta E variance, we're still in target. Make sure that's okay with your customer. That's a pretty large variance because it's easily seen with the eye. But in reality, this is the industry specification for quality or offset graphic arts industry specification for quality tolerance specifications. The 
So in review, we defined the playing field. We looked at the device. We determined, of course, the speed, the size, the layout, everything is critical for the workflow, as well as the type of paper it can run and the type of ink that's going to be used on that paper or substrate. We've also looked at the data coming in and realized that not all data is optimized for printing. Sometimes we have to go through transformations or additional definitions in those color files in order for them to print correctly. The substrate you use has to be defined, and we realize that in inkjet printing especially, the substrate is critical, and the how much color and how vibrant and how much edge effect you get and how much the smooth gradients appear on that paper. Sometimes the better quality papers cost more. Well, usually they do. In order to get more color, more detail, then you need to spend more on that paper in order to get that color out of that paper. As inkjet advances and more paper is sold, I imagine those prices will be reduced because of volume. In order to get the solution right the first time and not disappoint a customer, let's work together to try to define all these variables up front. But if we do fail, if we do stumble, let's stay in the game. Come to the technical group, gather around your other sales reps or your other people in your technical expertise area, huddle and try to come up with some ideas. Many times it's not a failure of the device, sometimes it's a failure of the process. So let's look at what failed, define it, so we can try to avoid that next time. So then we can stay in that game, and we can manage that disappointment, and we can understand what the customer is trying to reach. Industry says customers might be knowledgeable, or they might be novices. But the industry also says we need to set procedures, we need to set tolerances, we need to understand and set an expectation. If we don't do that, we can't manage the disappointment. We will fail. As we move forward with color offerings, as we begin to define these variables more and more, we'll get better and better at it. We'll be more and more successful. This concludes Section 2 of Color Management. And color is not just black and white.